California Forward is an organization that was formed uh, several years ago out of a commitment by a group of foundations that felt that the current system wasn't responding communi to community values, to community needs. If you look at the list of foundations, these are all foundations that have invested heavily in California, particularly in social services and others, and they found it somewhat frustrating that the things they wanted to accomplish were often uh, f found barriers to those things through the governmental and finance system. So California Forward was formed, um, uh, again, as I mentioned a couple of years ago, to look at both governance and fiscal issues in the state and to begin to bring reform agendas to voters. Um, so what we're going to do today is to talk a little bit about what some of those elements are. And there are four or five of them that I want you to think about. We are at www.caforward.org. You'll see that on the screen in another minute. Um, but th think about this. Think about how government itself ought to be organized in order to, A, improve outcomes, how authority and responsibility ought to be in, uh, aligned, and think about this with respect to schools. We're, of course, interested in government generally and how, how uh, public policy operates, but let's think today specifically about schools. Let's also think about how, what the role of the state ought to be and what the role of community governments ought to be in all this. Much of this is the same problem that we've seen with the way in which pu public policy making has gravitated to the state. And from a political point of view, those of you who are political activists, you think, well, where's the center of power? Well, the center of power used to be in community governments in our old system. And now the center of power tends to be at the state level. So I want to talk a little bit about the public finance system and kind of how we got here and what what uh, what this is, and the best thing to do, look, take a look at this chart, which I'm hoping I can point to with a little, um, what the, the, I, I got it, this is right here. Oh, okay, cool. thank you. Th there was a time when um, uh, w the life was simpler. The state had its own responsibilities and a tax system that financed it, and community governments uh, had responsibilities. They had a tax system that supported it, and somehow we changed over time. If you look at this, uh, at that top orange line up there, that represents uh, what we affectionately know as the sales tax. That little blue line down there on the bottom represents the uh, income tax. And back here in the 1950s, we spent about 65% of our disposable income on durable goods, cars, refrigerators, washing machines. And we spent about 35% of our disposable income on service. All right? Now, what, what's happened is to carry that forward all the way to the year 2000, we've discovered that we spend 35% of our, good, our, our disposable income on durable goods, and we spend 65% of our income on services. So the question is, as always, how do you align our fiscal system, our tax system, with the economy? Well, friends, we are out of alignment. And I would submit to you that if you look at this, this is the amount of general fund revenue that was attributable to the sales tax in 1950, about 60% of the state's income was attributable to the sales tax, and about 10% to the income tax. And then as time went on, because the economy changed, the, the amount of reliance on the sales tax declined, all right, and the amount of uh, reliance on the income tax increased. Now, a couple of things happened uh, during that long period of time. One of them is the voters decided to put a limitation on the property tax right about here in 1978. Some of you may recall or know about that. And in doing so, what they did was to take our general uh, 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 responsibility for, for funding government and take it out of the property tax system and put it into the income tax, right? So our reliance on services generally went into the income tax and our reliance on property and, uh, uh, t tax, and those resources declined. Now, you're going to hear more for both Phil and Lenny about that uh, dynamic, so I'm not going to talk much about the property tax today. But the whole point I'm trying to make is over time, these trends in our tax system, and remember that the tax system is the thing that supports our governmental enterprises, whether they are schools or social services or health services, that the, co that the complex nature of that has changed from a balance between community governments, schools, community colleges, county, cities, to a state system. Now, whoops, I'm going to go back to this. So um, wh what's the state done with all this? Well, there was a time, again, when I, I mentioned earlier, when the state had a state system that 
uh, provided resources for state government activities, higher ed, its prison system, um, uh, and a system that was relatively well balanced. Well, if you look back to, at the year 2000, uh, again, after 1978, the state took on more and more obligations for both uh, K-12 education and health and human services. But look at the difference between the brown line, the dark brown line, and the light uh, brown line or orange line. And in each case, there hasn't been sufficient tax revenue in order to support spending. So we have this tradition where spending and revenue, tax revenue balance, all right? This was a tradition that California's had. We even had a provision that went into the Constitution in 1849 that said you couldn't borrow money in order to finance ongoing services. The only thing you borrowed money for was infrastructure. Well, what we've been doing is we've been borrowing money in order to make the brown line, the dark brown line, match the light brown line. So the, the state's put itself in this fiscal condition by not having a balance between resources available and expenditures. Uh, now that brings us to another point, uh, and that is whenever the economy grows, and remember we're a dynamic economy in California. That this is not Minnesota, this is not Nebraska, for heaven's sakes. We're a very dynamic economy. We've been dynamic for most of the post-World War II period, um, which means that as the economy grows quickly, it produces resources. When it, um, when it declines because of recessions and, and the business cycle, it loses money. Well, what the state did in 1999 and 2000 is it provided a whole lot of money to K-12 education and community colleges. Great idea. It didn't save a nickel. It didn't put any of that into reserves. That's why budgets in 1999 and, and 2000 grew by 15%. The following year grew by 18%. And you all were happy because an enormous amount of resources went into, into um, both K-12 education. Some of you know about the so-called Proposition 98 guarantee. They over-appropriated it. In other words, they put more money into it than it otherwise would have required. And everybody was happy. We meet a short-term high-tech recession in 2001 and they had to take things apart. If they had only put a portion of that into reserves, like maybe half of it, you'd had 8 or 10% growth in those two years. If you just put it aside, you would not have had to have gone through what you all went through in 2000 and 2002 and three to take programs apart. There would have been sufficient money in reserves in order to do that. So our view is you, you need to have a fiscal system that makes some sense. Now, um, uh, all of you are political activists, because that's why you're here. And I'm an old policy hack. That's what I do for a living. So uh, what I want to do is I want to get you interested in this stuff, and I want to get you interested in not just to say, gee, let's raise the tax and put more into K-12 education. I want to get you into smart governance. Give me about smart policy and smart governance, and maybe connecting governance, authority to act, with resources that you're able to use for those purposes. And you could actually connect tax policy, the taxes you raise, with, with those responsibilities. Now, the, the you know, people ask, well, how did the state get into the situation that it did? Well, it did two things. It took on new obligations, and it expanded uh, uh, expenditures. And if you look at, I won't go through the details of this, but the thing that's the mo I think the most interesting about it is look at uh, over a 10-year period what the average growth rate was in social services. It was 14%. What was the average growth rate in the Healthy Families Program? It was 39% because it started with virtually nothing, and it got to which means that system will grow really fast. But look at the bottom number. K to 14 over that 10-year period grew by 4.5%. 4.5% over that period of time when everything else grew like crazy. So my, my kind of underlying view is that it, we're, we're at a point in our history where we're going to have to match both resources and spending priorities. We are now gaining less in our tax revenue as a percent of our economy than we did uh, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, and that number has been declining since the, probably the 60s, if you want to go back that far. Uh, particularly in K-12 education, as, as K-12 uh, uh, education spending as a percent of the economy has been on a general decline in the last 20 years or so. So governor's going to come out with some new things. Um, but many, any, uh, raise your hand if you know what, what the words Prop 98 mean. Oh, good. Okay. Now, the great frustration occurred in the 1980s when Governor Duke Major and the legislature couldn't figure out what to do about uh, uh, putting more resources into, into uh, K-12 education, the uh, 
uh, teachers came out with an initiative measure uh, that was killed, um, come up with another measure in 1988, and it was called Prop Ni Proposition 98. It's a very simple formula. It says that uh, we want to have a minimum funding level for K to for K to 14 education. That's K to 12 plus community colleges, and we want it to be a baseline for funding, and it should grow with the economy. So it should grow with personal income. Actually, it should grow with per capita personal income. Remember that 4.5% I showed you earlier? 10 years, average growth rate, 4.5%. Thank you very much, Prop 98. Now, uh, has it helped? Sure. New growth in per capita personal income drives the guarantee. So the more wealth there is in California and the more it grows, the better off K-12 education is. That's cool. Now, uh, well, no, there's $9.5 billion of deferred uh, expenditures for Prop 98. What we call that, that's $10 billion worth of resources that the Prop 98 guarantee is supposed to give, give that it does not. Those are deferrals. And this year, you're going to see on Monday, another deferral, more deferrals. So those obligations simply get deferred. And then I, I mentioned the other one about the fact that it grew by 4.5% a year. So what should we do? Uh, we, we have a series of proposals that we ho are hoping that you will look at. Um, we'd like you to visit our website uh, to think about some of these ideas, and particularly how they affect community colleges and K-12. Uh, we want to put more local economic growth into the school finance system. Now, people say, oh, that's a Serrano budget. We can't do that. If you think about it, think about uh, school districts in Santa Clara County, which is where we are. Uh, why not have a portion of the growth in the property tax remain within the county, allocated on a per-student basis? Please don't do it on an individual district basis, because you'll all get in trouble with respect to this notion of the connection between wealth and school expenditures. We don't want to do that. The, the Serrano decision was all about that. But at a county-wide level, there's a lot you can do. Another is to provide some form of a county-wide tax base for K-12. All right, county-wide tax base. You don't have a county-wide tax base now. You basically, your tax base, the property tax system, uh, is basically part of the school finance system. So as your property taxes grow, state aid is simply reduced unless you're uh, uh, so-called basic aid. How many are basic aid districts in the room? We've got a couple of them. Okay, uh, thank you. The rest of you, I hope, are, are revenue limit districts. The problem is those, of, those districts that have a high reliance on the property tax, anytime you get a property growth in the property tax, you get to keep it. But these other districts that rely on state aid, any increase in their property tax and state aid goes down. They get less, so they, there's no I interest on the part of those districts with respect to the economic well-being of their community. The other piece of this is to try to revise the state uh, system to get more equity into it. Frankly, it is an inequitable system that exists. And to, to speak to this question of community colleges, we, one of the things we're looking at is how you could increase collaboration among uh, work, interest in workforce development and community colleges uh, at not only the, the district level, but at the regional level as well. We've got some ideas about that. Again, our website is www.caforward.org. We have five things we care about. We think that we ought to focus on outcomes as part of governmental responsibilities. We think you should align authority and responsibility, as I mentioned earlier, with respect to a tax system, as well as the authority to, to uh, uh, operate. We need to change the state's role. The state's role ought not to be in micromanaging those community assets that ought to be focused at the community level, as I mentioned earlier, with respect to improving outcomes. There ought to be a system for encouraging regional collaboration, in particular workforce development, so we can tie a new economy with a new educational framework, one would hope. Uh, and then finally, uh, providing incentives for uh, the organizational structure of, of our, our community governments. So this is an agenda list we have. Again, our website is at www.caforward.org. We'd love your participation. You can sign up for um, more information. We've been having uh, workshops on a variety of these issues. We're having an, one here in the valley on, help me out, on May, on the 21st. Okay, you'll find it on our website. It's here in, in, uh, in San Jose, I think. Thank you, uh, and thank you very much.